So, well, thank you very much. Uh, and I want to thank the um, organizers for the opportunity to talk to you uh, today about this. And uh, I welcome all the, um, all the uh, participants uh, from around the country, I guess. So this is a, an amazing conference uh, that the CFRI is putting on for us. Okay, so uh, before I get started, I just want to uh, talk a little bit about or acknowledge um, some of the people who have contributed to the, the ideas and the concepts uh, that I'm going to present this afternoon. Um, I have a long-term uh, working relationship collaboration with uh, the trio at uh, San Diego State, including Forrest Rover, Rower, Anka, and Dwayne Roach at San Diego State. Um, and this has been uh, we've been working with a group of graduate students and postgraduate trainees, uh, the most recent of which is Anna Cobian, who I think some of you were able to hear some of her work earlier this morning. Just an outstanding group of individuals who have contributed just uh, a huge amount uh, to these ideas. Um, I also like to acknowledge uh, Chip Schooley, um, who is our uh, co-founder of the um, Innovative Phage Application and Therapeutics Unit at UC San Diego, also known as IPATH, and also my, um, my favorite clinical microbiologist, uh, David Pride. I uh, also would like to very much acknowledge uh, the critical role that the CFRI Tom Spruance Foundation, uh, providing funding for some real foundational work that allowed us to uh, move up in this area, as well as the NIH. Okay, so today's um, topic is going to be more or less a, a primer on uh, phage therapy. It's designed for a general audience, somebody that might be um, not too familiar with the concepts. Uh, so we'll be uh, presenting from that point of view. For those people who are familiar uh, with the concepts of phage therapy, I'll be spending a fair amount of time uh, towards the end talking just about some of the challenges and logistics from a clinical perspective that uh, aren't always uh, presented. So I guess our story starts over 100 years ago um, when uh, a number of microbiologists uh, started identifying small particles or something that was inhibiting bacterial growth. And generally they were working in the area of dysentery and the first person to really report anything like along these lines was uh, Friedrich Twort, who was a, um, a microbiologist out of England. And he was able to show uh, that there was something smaller than a bacterium that could, that could kill bacteria. And, and um, although this is not from his paper, uh, the middle photo shows a, a, what we call a plaque lysis plate, which shows a, um, a bacterial lawn, and those spots are areas uh, where uh, the phage have killed the bacteria. And this assay, plaque assay, is still commonly used to assess um, susceptibility to the bacteria. But our story really took off with um, a French-Canadian microbiologist, Felix de Harel, uh, who uh, was working in Paris at the time. And he also identified, almost independently of Tort, uh, the, these, there, there was something inhibiting um, bacterial growth. Um, he identified them or called them, gave them their name, called bacteriophage, but the real nature of it wasn't really well known. Despite that, he actually uh, continued to work on it outside of even the dysentery area and, and developed a, a lab that developed these kind of phage preparations, as he called them, to um, address a number of human conditions like uh, rhinosinusitis, uh, more on diarrhea, even um, uro urologic infections, skin infections. And so this was uh, developed into a small industry over time. It wasn't until later when they actually identified these viruses as the, uh, these small particles, and I show you um, some pictures here in the uh, upper middle area of some viral particles. And um, these are classic phage particles. It comes out of an article by Chip Schooley. Um, the, the wonderful photo in the lower left is a, uh, is a, it almost looks like these phage 
strange particles are coming out of some cosmic nebula, but um, you get some really fantastical pictures of, of these viruses over time. In the lower right is, is a, a commonly depicted um, viral particles. They have that area in the upper area here, the head or the capsid. Uh, this blue area here is the uh, nucleic acid, typically DNA. You have a collar, uh, this, this kind of central trunk, and then you get these leg-like things. They almost look like little lunar landers. And these are, the, um, um, these are the way the virus interacts with the uh, bacterial host. So these viruses, as they are, um, are all over the place. Um, they're probably the most common life form uh, that we see on Earth. And we see them throughout the environment, including all through the human body. And this is a uh, uh, x-ray of a CF patient who coughed up some sputum. And uh, this is a, what we call an epifluorescence uh, study of that sputum. So the viruses were isolated out of that uh, sputum and concentrated. Uh, this was done by Forces Ro Force Rowers Lab. And what you can see is that the stain is picking up DNA from all these viruses. And so even in CF sputum, we're seeing lots and lots and lots of these viruses. They're part of our, they're part of our normal microbiome. So these viruses are interesting from the point of view that they don't particularly attack humans, uh, human cells. Uh, they're, they're really um, pathogenic for the bacteria uh, that they interact with. And this is a, a common cartoon showing the interaction, the initial interaction, where these viruses will float around, come in contact with the bacteria, and then they interact with it at the cell surface. So it's this, it's the, there are protein-protein interactions between these tail fibers and proteins on the cell wall. And once that happens, there's this conformational change in a series of events, which eventually results in the injection of the DNA into the um, bacterial cell. So this is going to be uh, arguably one of the most important slides of the uh, conceptually of the um, of the talk here. Um, we already showed you a picture of the virus adsorbing to the cell, um, the microbial cell, the bacterial cell, and it's injecting its DNA as shown here. And then what happens in, uh, in the lytic cycle, there are two life cycles, one called lytic and the other is lysogenic, but initially let's just talk about the lytic cycle. Um, the nucleic acid DNA gets injected into the cell and it uh, makes, uh, basically it hijacks the machinery of the bacterial cell and it generates uh, many copies of itself, uh, anywhere from 10 to 30 copies of itself. And eventually uh, the bacterial cell is lysed and these bacteria are free to roam the environment and come in contact with other bacteria. And so we get this cycle of basically a self-replicating killing, bacterial killing machine, okay? Very effective. In the laboratory, this whole process can take as little as like 20 minutes, okay? In the human body, it's probably uh, takes much longer. Now, there's an alternative life cycle that is very important to consider and to know about, and this is called the ly a lysogenic life cycle. And in this part of the cycle, the DNA, after being injected, uh, gets incorporated uh, through some um, sites uh, and some proteins called integrases, and it gets incorporated into the bacterial genome. And therefore, it becomes part of the genome. And so every time the cell divides, the, um, the, the virus, which is now called a prophage, it also divides, okay? So it replicates with the host and and that how it how that that's how it exists over time. Now, um, so this, when you have a bacterial cell infected with a phage, we call it a lysogen. And these lysogens um, or lysogens are responsible for many of the um, bacterial illnesses that we're familiar with. Okay, so uh, cholera, for instance, or typhus, or um, even E. coli mediated. Um, uh, renal disease. This is all. These are all mediated 
um, by virulence factors and other exotoxins that are carried along in this prophage DNA. There are certain conditions where uh, we get a process called uh, induction, where this prophage is actually kicked out and the, um, the DNA then goes to construct more of these viral particles, killing its host along the way. So, um, and one commonly known technique or commonly known uh, chemical that does this is uh, fluoroquinolone, such as Cipro. So it's actually felt that one of the ways Cipro might be killing or might be working in some patients is through induction events of uh, prophage. Okay, so um, that life cycle is important. I think uh, for the purposes of this talk, uh, we're concerned about uh, lysogeny and we wanna take advantage of the lytic cycle in terms of phage therapy. So phage therapy has been talked about for a long time. As I mentioned, the, the concept of it uh, dates back to the 1920s and the argument, the, 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 the uh, discussion, so to speak, of how, how it can be used for therapy has been raging for many decades. I, um, there were just two articles here from JAMA from the 1930s and 1940s. Uh, it never really took hold in Western medicine, mostly because we were uh, dealing with uh, antibiotics, which were logistically and easier to, to regulate. But phage therapy continued to be a, an important part of the an anti-infective approaches in Eastern Bloc countries. So let's fast forward a few decades. And now, as many of you know, reading the lay literature, we're having big problems with multi-drug resistant uh, bacterial infections, both in CF and outside of CF. And uh, we're seeing an increase in uh, uh, deaths from this. And the other thing that's not happening is a broadening of our antibiotic pipeline, okay? And so this um, couple, this problem coupled with a, a couple of remarkable um, case studies where phage therapy was used as an adjunctive therapy um, uh, started to spark uh, this interest in use of it, uh, use of phage therapy in a broader, um, in a broader context. So, so phage therapy, we're trying to take advantage of that lytic life cycle. Uh, we also realize that there are other ways that phage therapy may be uh, helping some of these patients. We believe that in some cases, the phage therapy is, um, is assisting or being ad, uh, um, basically an adjunct to standard antibiotic therapy. In some cases, it's improving antibiotic susceptibility. Um, so use of phage may allow us to use standard antibiotics more effectively. And there's reasons to believe that phage therapy may enhance um, our own immune responses or break down the, uh, the biofilm uh, in some of the infections that uh, are being uh, addressed by this therapy. So when we talk about uh, phage therapy, we have, uh, there's two general approaches that are being uh, used at this point. Uh, the first is fixed phage cocktails and the other ones are custom. In the fixed phage cocktail approach, um, there is a, um, a, a group, a cocktail they're calling them, of phage. So they're a group of five phage that are prepped up and they're mixed together. And um, these fixed cocktails um, are effective against a certain percentage of uh, patients. So for instance, there's two clinical trials uh, that are going to be starting in at least two clinical trials. They'll be starting uh, in North America over the next uh, 12 months. Both of them are using fixed cocktails. These cocktails are going to be um, effective. They're going to have at least one phage that's going to um, be able to um, kill a number of, of pseudomonas. And they estimate about 85% of all patients with pseudomonas, of CF patients with pseudomonas, are going to have at least one of these phage. Um, that will be effective against them, okay? So this is probably the cheapest way. They're, they're pre-prepared. Uh, the FDA loves it because they only have one thing to approve and watch uh, and to, um, uh, you know, approve. And it can be used much like a standard drug, okay? Um, the custom phage cocktail is a different approach. 
Uh, in this approach, um, you develop a library of, um, of phage that are effective against a certain, certain um, bacteria, okay? I think one thing I forgot to mention earlier is that these, the interaction between the phage and the bacteria is somewhat specific. So we can talk about a pseudomonas phage or a staph phage. So a pseudomonas phage wouldn't necessarily lyse a staph phage and vice versa, okay? And these phage have different um, uh, spectrum of, uh, of um, ability to attack a certain taxa, okay? So we can talk about developing a pseudomonas uh, phage library, and we can take a candidate uh, organism from a patient who might be having some problems and check our, say, 20, 20 pseudomonas phage against that pseudomonas. And we might identify five or six phage out of that, out of that 20 that might be um, able to lyse that uh, isolate. And so we will go ahead and prep up that and make a cocktail of that of those phage that are um, that we know are are going to be able to adhere and lyse that candidate organism. Okay, so this is a, a more personalized approach. Uh, it requires much more time and it's uh, it's more labor intensive. Okay, but uh, arguably um, more effective in the long run. So there are some challenges. You might say, well, that sounds good, Doug. Let's just jump in and do it. Um, but there are some challenges. Uh, this is a very young field and there's a lot of information uh, that we don't know. Uh, some of these include the specificity for the bacterial targets that I alluded to. Um, uh, some of the libraries aren't extensive enough for certain uh, bacteria. Even if you do have, um, say, five phage that kill this one uh, isolate, uh, you're not going to kill all the pseudomonas in that uh, patient, and so you have to be uh, prepared to retreat the patient. There are ecological considerations. Um, what's going to grow in the niche uh, that uh, is vacated by the population that you killed? This lysogeny hangs over our head. Are there any exotoxins or pathogenicity genes uh, left in the, in the phage? Uh, we select uh, I'm not going to talk more about this, but there, um, there's a problem with phage resistance. And I'm going to expand a little bit more on the regulatory issues and the ethical considerations later in this talk. So let's talk a little bit about um, some of these challenges in more detail. So we do have a problem. Uh, it's not a huge problem, um, but for certain taxa, uh, there's just not that many um, phage around. We do have a fair number of phage for, say, staph or pseudomonas, for instance. But it also makes you, uh, makes it very important to know, uh, to know what is the pathogen. And I think um, some of you were able to hear from uh, Forrest and Anna earlier this morning, and that uh, even among patients who, who we think just have pseudomonas, their, their microbiome, the, the, the community of bacteria in that individual is quite uh, unique to that individual. And uh, it, it pays, in our opinion, to really um, study the patients ahead of time and to really know uh, what pathogen you're dealing with or, or you might have an unsuccessful uh, phage therapy. Okay, uh, I mentioned earlier um, that the availability of phage libraries are, are, are very important uh, when we select patients uh, for this kind of study. Um, so the other thing that is posing some challenges are the phage themselves, and they need to be well-characterized phage. I mentioned uh, that phage is like one of the, it's, it's, it's one of the last um, frontiers in biology in a sense that um, most of the viruses out there, most of the bacteriophage out there in, in the environment are not well-characterized. and there's a lot of, when we sequence these preparations and we, and we uh, put the sequences together, there are a lot of genes that we don't know what they're doing. We have some information um, to identify some of these proteins. Do they have those integrases, which are proteins that help put that DNA into the bacterial genome that um, forms these lysogens, which we want to avoid. So we're 
for phage therapy. When we want to avoid phage that have integrases. We have computer algorithms that will try to predict um, exotoxins and integrase-like activity. Okay, so uh, the point of the slide is, is that uh, before we put any of these phage into anybody, we, we really have to do a complete analysis of the uh, sequence analysis of these phage. And there are still, even with that, we're still going to have a fair amount of unknown sequence that we don't know what it's doing. Uh, in terms of uh, protocol development, um, we have, uh, do we use a fixed cocktail or a selected phage? Do we use uh, a single phage or do we infuse multiple phage? Which dosing route? Do we use IV or inhalation? How do we uh, dose it? The frequency, how long we, fre how long we uh, dose the phage? Uh, do we do how do we dose it in conjunction with antibiotics the patient gets, is receiving? How many plaque forming units or PFUs? Do we use 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8? So these are all questions um, that are still uh, being uh, uh, discussed uh, in, in, in terms of protocol development. In terms of how do I get a hold of it, uh, how do I uh, get access to phage therapy, there are two, um, two ways currently. Uh, one through is an IND qualifying clinical trial. Uh, and I mentioned earlier that there are two of these, uh, one by the NIH and there's another company in Southern California that is are setting up um, two studies that are gonna start um, within the next 12 months. Um, both of these are using the IV approach and not inhalation because they don't have good animal toxicity data yet for inhalation. The other, um, the other way phage therapy is administered right now is through what we call single patient INDs. These uh, in investigational new drugs uh, applications through the FDA. Uh, they're being done under emergent and non-emergent uh, conditions. Uh, the FDA is becoming a little bit more strict right now, and we've got, um, we have some approval uh, right now for some of our patients to do uh, non-emergent um, uh, non phage therapy, which was a big deal and has taken us a long time to get down. But these single patient INDs turn out to be quite important. Uh, I think uh, we, we gain a lot of experience in terms of how to dose, uh, what kind of toxicity, how to follow the patients in terms of efficacy. Um, the FDA has, although they're, they're very safe for patients to receive, um, they're, they're, um, the regulatory approval um, hurdles are much less than they would be for um, an IND qualifying type approach. So um, let's talk a little bit more about uh, single patient INDs. Uh, uh, there's a few centers around the country that are doing them. Uh, Yale, for instance, is doing some, and, and we are currently also doing um, some single patient INDs. These are currently unfunded projects, uh, uh, which poses a lot of challenges for um, the people involved. Uh, in terms of patient selection, we're looking for patients who are clinically uh, unstable, uh, they're losing lung function uh, very fast, or they might have recurrent hemoptysis, major atelectasis, hypervariable lung function, people who are uh, exacerbating quite frequently, and, and patients who may not have a whole lot of other options. They may not be eligible for modulators, or they've, for whatever reason, taken them, themselves out of transplant consideration. Also, uh, another big uh, group of patients that we're looking for are people who just can't use standard antibiotics anymore. They may not be working anymore. They may have a long list of allergies after decades of use. They may have long-term toxicity, hearing loss, renal insufficiency, or they may just have a very high level of genetic resistance. The other thing we look for patients, uh, inpatients uh, that we get into these kind of programs is a willingness to participate in follow-up studies. Uh, this is, as I mentioned, currently unfunded and uh, the investigators uh, helping the patients, working with the patients, we absolutely need to learn from every patient uh, that we put through one of these projects. Uh, in terms of efficacy and toxicity endpoints, what are we looking at? We've got clinical and physiology, standard spirometry. 
I work closely, for instance, with the San Diego State Group to get metagenomes, metatranscriptome, viromes, metabolomes. All this kind of behind the scenes works allows us to assess why it worked, if it does work, and, and if it doesn't work, it allows us to figure out whether, the, um, whether we're hitting our targets, in other words. And then we have some specialized radiographic and clinical microbiology endpoints that we also look at. Uh, in terms of uh, regulatory requirements, uh, the FDA has changed over time. It's a little bit of a moving target. I have to tell you, our recent experience with them has been very good and constructive. You almost get a sense that they actually want to ha have this work. Um, our, uh, the IRBs at the institutions that you work with have to feel comfortable with this kind of work. They have to have some expertise in um, uh, phage biology and, um, and, and lung disease and cystic fibrosis, for instance. We do have some ethical considerations also. So we've had our first few patients, uh, we, are, uh, we either have gone through or are having them go through um, ethical um, ethics committee review. Um, some of the things that have come up uh, during these reviews um, have been um, to be sure that we've disclosed all known and unknown risks, um, to be sure that the patients know that we lack efficacy data. Um, the people also, the committee also is very concerned about whether the patient has decision-making capability in a sense that um, they realize that some of the patients coming through are very vulnerable, they're, they're almost in palliative type uh, level care, and they just want to be sure that, um, um, that the patient is making uh, an informed decision. Um, there are some justice uh, kind of issues, ethical issues. Um, it's a limited resource and we have to justify who gets therapy and who gets who's offered therapy because we cannot offer it to everybody. Um, so we have to pick and choose, um, uh, you know, who's, who's going to benefit most and um, how can we move forward. Who's going to pay for it? Like I mentioned, it's currently unfunded. Uh, this turns out to be less important because the way uh, we are doing it, it's mostly done in conjunction with standard uh, standard of care therapy. So it's kind of an add-on to standard therapy. So does it work? Uh, we've gone through all this and the big thing is we don't know. We don't have any clinical trials at this point. I have to tell you that there's been some uh, convincing successes with phage therapy in non-CF, in the non-CF world. Um, there have been um, some important published data, case reports, in infections with left ventricular assist devices, uh, craniotomy sites, prostatic knees, post lung transplant pneumonias, pancreatic abscesses, bone infections. So there's a, a, a growing list of, of infections where it's been used uh, with some success. Uh, in terms of CF, there are unpublished reports from my colleagues, both at Yale and in Germany, uh, where they were using mostly inhaled. Uh, we um, nobody's seen any major safety concerns uh, for, through the inhaled route, and they seem to think that there's been some clinical success. In terms of published uh, data in CF, um, there's some uh, we've it's been looked at in both pre and post transplant patients. Uh, there have been cases of Burkholderia, M. abscessus, and Pseudomonas in this context, and I I leave you the um, the article. PMID numbers, if you want to look into that further. So how do we approach this at UC San Diego? So uh, we go through this patient selection process where we identify these clinically unstable patients. And then we do a sputum, then we get a sputum uh, from them. And we run them through something, what we call a CF, a rapid response, which I think Forrest expanded on in a lot more detail earlier this morning. But basically, this is a very comprehensive sputum analysis uh, that allow us to identify all the pathogens or potential pathogens. It'll look, uh, we, we look for exotoxins, exotoxin production, virulence factors, and antibiotic resistance. And then we see if there's any clinically actionable information or any information that can be confirmed with standard clinical testing. 
If we don't find anything um, that is clinically actionable and we are running out of, of options in terms of standard antibiotics, then we will take the clinical isolate uh, from the microbiology lab. We'll do whole genome sequencing on that. Again, focusing on the um, evidence for exotoxin production, virulence, and antibiotic resistance. We'll then go ahead and screen available libraries for lytic phage that have already been well characterized. Uh, and we try to identify as many as three or four. We do large scale preps. We uh, make applications through the FDA, uh, go through and, the, and our own local IRB. And uh, if necessary, we'll, uh, we'll uh, have an ethics committee review the case and, and or interview the patient. And if all that goes well, then we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and add it into a patient's uh, regimen at some point. So that's all I wanted to uh, talk about today. It's a very uh, conceptual kind of talk, uh, kind of a primer on, um, on bacteriophage or phage therapy. What I want you to remember is that these are uh, common viruses that uh, lice microbial hosts, bacterial hosts, and they provide a very important top-down control of these uh, bacterial populations. The phage have complex life cycles that can mediate uh, disease severity. And for this reason, we want to avoid the lysogenic life's, um, life cycle to every extent possible. Um, we're trying to take advantage of the lytic life cycle so we could use phage as uh, anti-infective uh, therapy. The biology itself and the ecological context that we work in does pose some challenges uh, that in our opinion, we uh, need to monitor the patients very closely, not only before, but after phage therapy. And uh, early clinical trials and single patient INDs are, are helping us inform uh, how we might be able to use this therapy in the future.